Good afternoon, Canucks fans. Good afternoon on a game day, Canucks fans. It is another episode of Canucks Conversation, as always, is brought to you by the 2023 Toyota BZ4X. The BZ4X is Toyota's brand new all-electric SUV that is designed to go the distance for you and your family. The BZ4X is packed with Toyota's coolest tech, but it still has that trusty SUV feel you know and love. And even though it's electric, it's capable of effortlessly conquering any terrain. Whether it's rain, snow, mud, or your friend's questionable post-game recaps, the BZ4X will get you through it all. My name is Dave Woodrelli. That is Harmon Dial. Joining me, not from the sauna today, from the kitchen, it looks like, Harmon Dial joining us. Uh, Harmon, do you want to tell everybody about our golf game yesterday? Yeah, it was... Um, first of all, you made you made us drive out, Faber and I, 40 minutes to Coquitlam to play on one of the worst courses we, we've ever seen. It just because it was convenient for you, just a 10 minute drive away. Um, but you know what? It was a blast. I came into it expecting to do horribly because I rarely play golf or pitch and putt, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but we were roughly around the same skill level and, um, and I didn't, didn't feel out of place there. So for me, that's a W. You caught some balls. And I mean, you and I both, we were saying we're just too strong. There was a couple that we hit over the fence couple bombs for us uh but you you were you got some you got some good hits off you you were doing really well some nice shots as someone who's golf for years would say it uh yeah you, you did well and it wasn't just because the course was close to my house let's just get that out in the open it's because it's empty i told you it was empty look you want to go to a pitch and button wait for 50 minutes be my guest. We'll go to Queen Elizabeth. We'll go to Stanley Park whatever we'll wait for 50 minutes for each shot that we have to take or whatever Unlike this place, you go, you book a time, you're in. It's great. It's a great little par uh, par three. We'll go to a real course soon. I think that's the next step for us. You 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 got some good shots off yesterday, though. I think you're ready. I think you're ready to go. Ready to jump into the big leagues. But I will say, Queenie, you can catch. Uh, I mean, I've never had to wait at Queenie. It's it's close. It's close by my house. It's a way better course. Um, it's, it's a blast. And so, no, I'm not buying the, oh, it was, it was the only one that would have been empty excuse. Okay. We went on a Sunday. I'm just pointing, or did we go yesterday? No, we went yesterday, Monday. We went on. A, okay. It might've been a little, little less busy at Queenie, but all I know is one time Faber and I went to Queenie and they said, yeah, it's a 45 minute wait to get onto a freaking pitch and putt. So we left, we left and went somewhere else. One of the great courses in the great city of Burnaby. Also had to wait a little bit there, but it wasn't nearly as long. I just, I'm not a waiter. I don't like waiting. I don't like sitting around and doing nothing. I got to be doing something. I, that's why I'm always late for everything. And I'm not always late, but I time everything down to the minute and I'm always ready to go. Anyways, let's not waste any more time talking about our golf, uh, our golf game and everything. We got a game to talk about harm. Uh, we're going to start by talking about Sunday's game, which feels like ages ago, against the Anaheim Ducks, a game the Canucks won by a final score of 3-2. to two. Jeff Patterson is going to join us later in segment two, and then our third segment will preview tonight's game between the Vegas Golden Knights and the Vancouver Canucks. But Harm, let's start with Sunday's game. The Canucks walk out of there with a 3-2 victory. Dakota Joshua picks up a couple of goals. Yeah, and before we get into Joshua, I know... A lot of Canucks fans these days have some angst around the idea that, okay, they're not necessarily playing their best hockey these days. And while I understand the sort of rationale behind that and in this Anaheim game, it it being a little bit too close for comfort, what I'd like to point out is you look at the big picture, zoom out, the Canucks in March had five games against bottom feeder teams this month that you wanted them to take care of business against, right? Anaheim twice. Uh, the first, of course, being at the start of the month on the road trip, Calgary, Buffalo, Montreal, they won all of them. Now, to me, that's an impressive level of focus, given that even before they officially clinched, this team had all but already established itself a playoff spot. So to maintain that and, and sweep those teams, even though the games are closer than ideal, I think the Canucks deserve some credit for that, even though there's there's some concern lingering in the back of some fans' minds. And especially when you look at some recent games for other top teams in the West, for example, Colorado lost 4-1 to the Blue Jackets yesterday. On Saturday, the Kings lost 4-2 to the Flames. Edmonton just lost in OT against St. Louis last night and lost 5-3 against Ottawa in regulation just uh, over a week ago. So, yes, I know when you see teams like Anaheim and Calgary and Buffalo in the calendar, you expect to win and you expect dominance, but 
even though we didn't get that dominance, for them to still pick up all five of those wins, I think means something. And for March as a whole to go eight, three, and one when they didn't have Thatcher Demko for most of it, uh, I think, um, like, look, does this mean I have no concerns or question marks about this team heading into the playoffs? No, that's not what I'm saying. There are legit question marks, and, and we'll discuss some of those things. But let's remember to just zoom out, take a deep breath before we start having some concern about, oh, is this team not peaking at the right time? And remember that, all things considered, the month of, the month of March was successful for the Vancouver Canucks. Yeah, and I mean, it comes back to the context that we talked about last week, right? It's like, what are you worried about for the playoffs? Again, the five-on-five -five play slipped up a bit, but they got it back on track. They've shown flashes of getting the back to their staples. And like, I have no reason to believe, as crazy as this might sound to some people, I have no reason to believe that on night one of the Stanley Cup playoffs, the Canucks aren't just going to immediately play like they were when they were at their best at five-on-five. -five. I think they know what it takes to get to that level. I think they'll be there night one of the playoffs. I don't think we're going to see one of these. Oh, what happened tonight? I, I, I don't think we're going to see that in the playoffs. I think this team knows how to get back to their staples and how to get back to the things that Rick Tockett expects of them. I think when you wake up early for a Sunday game against Anaheim, it might be hard to commit to those staples. And uh, this is what I've been saying the past couple of weeks is like, I'm much more concerned about the power plays lack of success. And, and we'll get to that. Uh, than I am their five on five play. And Anaheim was just another example of that, not only because they scored a goal on the power play, but also because they slipped up at five on five. Like both of those goals shouldn't have happened. The first one, no real chance for Seelovs. It was pretty cleanly over his shoulder, couldn't have done much there. Second one, JT Miller just loses his man, stops skating. He loses Mason McTavish. Uh, post game talk, it just said that goal shouldn't have happened. I don't think that goal happens in the playoffs. Like I don't think for a guy who we hear JT Miller say yeah when you're playing Edmonton when you're playing this it's easy to get up for those games and you really focus in and it's really easier to play those games because you're so focused on those games like I have to think JT Miller's not going to lose his check like that in game one of the playoffs or in the playoffs at all for that matter and again I don't throw out some major jinxes right now but I'm just saying that I'm not worried about this team's ability to play at five on five when the games matter yeah and even since the all-star break which is you look at the Canucks record, it's 13, nine and three, which isn't spectacular. I think we've all agreed that since the Lindholm trade sort of being a barometer of, okay, the, the expectations for this team have ratcheted higher that they haven't played as dominantly as they have in the first half of the season when they were kicking the door down, boot stomping teams. Yeah. We haven't seen that, but even in that stretch, they are five and five metrics. They're consistently, um, among one of the top teams in the NHL at controlling play. Again, as you alluded to, and we're not going to beat beat the drum of the power play uh, for too much longer, but it is just if you get that man advantage back on track, now all of a sudden, even the games that you are just losing by a goal or or even the games like against Dallas where it's actually, yeah, they added a, an, an empty netter, I believe, um, where it's, it's two goals, but really it's a one goal hockey game. The power play completely can change the storyline. And that's one, one other thing to keep in mind is that we're talking about a stretch where the Canucks haven't been necessarily playing at their best. And yet we're still not getting any stinkers. You know what I mean? There haven't been any nights where think about when Vegas went through a, a lull just around a month ago, for example, they were getting blown out by teams like the Blue Jackets and the Sabres, right? Like that's a real sort of low point and of course Vegas has rebounded since then um but I think it's just important to to keep track of um the bigger picture of, of where this te team is at and again I understand the idea that yet yeah, we haven't seen the, their best form yet um but I also don't think they're far off and um and it's not like they're playing poor hockey yeah, and I mean, like, like let, let's talk about Dakota Joshua because I think he's a pretty key part of the story when we talk about the new look top six lines and what we saw in that game against Anaheim. Uh, as expected, I did really like the look of Dakota Joshua and Connor Garland with JT Miller in the middle. Thought I'd really like that line. Turns out I did. Um, what did you think of that line and more specifically Dakota Joshua and his performance? They were terrific. I mean, right from the start of the period, I mean, Joshua had a terrific slot chance after he and Miller won some battles. Uh, I think uh, back to Garland's rush chance that came from Joshua in the second period where uh, later on that play, they drew a penalty as well. And I mean, look, the Joshua first power play, uh, the first power play goal um, he had, 
the underrated hands around the net, right? We've spoken about how he has soft touch. Uh, one other thing that I found interesting on that play, which maybe didn't get uh, noticed as much, Hoaglander was also driving the net on the far side. And on a PK, every team will have a net front defenseman. Hoaglander sort of took away that defenseman because that defenseman, as the pass from Suter to Joshua came down low, the Anaheim defenseman was preoccupied with, okay, what's Hoaglander doing here? Is he darting into a spot where he could get the puck? Um, and, and it's that distraction which gave Joshua that little window of opportunity to pull off that fantastic move between um, his legs. It's also the first time the second unit power play has scored since Pia Suter <laughs> on uh, November 11th against the Toronto Maple Leafs. So that was um, nice to see. And then, I mean, in the third period, right, it's like the chemistry he and Garland have is unreal when Garland has the puck below the hash marks. And this is the biggest thing that I felt was missing when Joshua went out is Garland was still doing some of those spins and in turns, but especially when Micaiah, for example, is first on that line, it felt like the, the player who's supposed to be driving the slot, driving the net, didn't know how to perfectly get open for Garland. And that's where Joshua just seems to know uh, how to perfectly read off Garland in almost every situation. And um, and then the key also is when a guy gets an opportunity from that tight in net, I think we sometimes underestimate how difficult it can be to actually pick, let's say, far side or a corner as opposed to just shooting it straight into the middle of the goalie's chest because you don't have a lot of space to elevate the puck. The goalie is sometimes um, at the top of their crease. And that's where Joshua has become a clinical finisher because look, if Teddy Bluger gets that puck or if a lot of, uh, if, if a lot of other Vancouver forwards down the lineup, get that opportunity that Garland set up, that's not a goal. And I think that's a testament to Joshua's finishing ability this season as well. Yeah. And I mean, you brought up that we were golfing with favor on the weekend. Yeah. We, we were having some discussions about the power play and all I'll say is, man, it's great that that guy isn't allowed to give opinions anymore because Holy cow, he had some bad takes on the power play. Just going to say it. Just going to say it. <laughs> no, I kid, of course. But uh, the one thing I did want to talk about, and Dakota Josh with the net front, brought it up a couple times, and I brought it up to talk it, and he didn't dismiss it because in the same scrum, I brought up Dakota Josh with the net front and Niels Hoaglander in the bumper, but that was because at practice on Saturday, they showed Hoaglander in the bumper on PP2, and, and talk it entertained me a little bit. He gave me the full answer of, yeah, it takes a lot to play in the bumper. You need a high level of intelligence. You need to get a lot of experience there, which is, again, what we said on Friday's show. And he said, like, yeah, maybe maybe Hoaglander can become that guy. Did quite clearly pump the brakes on him being that guy for PP1. But Elise Patterson was absent on Saturday, and Dakota Joshua was at the net front. So I asked him about that, and he was like, no, he's just a placeholder. But I did really like what he looked like on the net front. And then on Sunday, of course, at the net front, he scores that goal, like you said, the first one since November. I had November 15th written down. I, I didn't know it was P.S. Suter that scored it, but yeah, P.S. Suter was the last goal scorer for PP2. Um, so just something interesting that I want to note. Dakota Josh with the net front. I'm throwing it out now, Harm. We talk about power play personnel. I think eventually Connor Garland gets off there. They put Dakota Joshua at the net front on PP1. I'm calling it now. Maybe. I wouldn't be surprised if they give it a look because, again, we've spoken about who's that fourth forward going to be? And they cycled through so many different options. And would it surprise me if the man advantage hits another lull and to mix things up, you give Joshua an opportunity? No, I mean, um, you haven't found that perfect solution. We got to continue this conversation. We'll continue with Jeff Harrison because we still got to talk about Archer Seelovs. Nikita Zadorov gets sat out for that game. There's a lot to get to, and we will get to it as we bring in the man himself, the man who talks about every game, Post game, Jeff Patterson is brought to you by Greta, the home of our electric watch parties. Greta is our spot to chill pre game, post game, and all through the off season as well. Check out Greta Bar YVR today. All right, let's bring him in, Jeff Patterson of Rinkwide Vancouver, and of course, Canucks Army. Jeff, how oh, look at that backdrop! Look at that new backdrop, shiny new backdrop. Mm. Uh, nice full screen, Grady. I like that. That is beautiful. Rink-wide Vancouver Canucks Army. Looking good, Jeff. I really like that. Yeah, did a little uh, interior decorating over the Easter long weekend and uh, came up with this. So a bit of a, a new look, but uh, I like it as well. Uh, I have to make sure that I don't wear navy so that I blend right into the backdrop, but uh, 
uh, you know, that's all some fashion choices that'll be required before these big Canucks combo hits. Hey, I got to say, and I'm glad to hear that talk it humored you on the net front because low key, one of my favorite moments from this season was when you tried to throw the PB and J line at talk it. <laughs> and like, I don't think he had any idea what the hell you were talking about. And he just kind of stared at you and was like, yeah, yeah, sure. And then we just all <laughs> carried on with the scrum, but yeah, PBJ didn't, uh, the line didn't stick together, the name didn't stick, and Talkit had no time for your question about PBJ. He laughed. He laughed. He laughed. It was I a still bit of an think, uncomfortable laugh. Yeah, I don't think he got the reference, though. Like, I, I'm sure he understands a PBJ sandwich, but I don't think, like, Phil and Brock and J Yeah, <laughs> PBJ. <laughs> well, one of these days, he's going to laugh at one of my jokes. One of these days, Jeff. Uh, okay. T about the game on Sunday, one mm. guy that we haven't talked about yet, Archer Silov's in net. We didn't talk about him at all. What'd you make of his game? And I know we're starting with the backup to the backup goaltender, but I, I thought Silov's played really well on Sunday against Anaheim. Yeah, I think anytime any guy's thrown into a situation like that, a first NHL action in over a year, uh, as dumb as it sounds, like stop the first one. Like, you know, if the first one somehow gets in past you, then nervous energy in the building, teammates are probably wondering, is this guy going to stop a shot? These are the Ducks. They had played the day before. This was four and six for them. They haven't scored more than three goals in a game, but once in their last 15 outings, they don't score. And so, uh, you know, for him, it was just like, this was a good fit. Like it was the right time to Smith had had a nice run, but early start, no morning skate, all that kind of stuff like takes a starting goaltender perhaps out of his rhythm. Uh, you know, for Arthur Silovs, I'm sure he had a little bit of notice that this was going to be his game. And I thought he settled in nicely. Uh, the Canucks were not good for the first five minutes. Again, given that the Ducks had played the day before and got smoked by the Oilers, uh, I thought the Canucks might jump all over them. They didn't. And Silovs had to make a couple of stops. And so, uh, you know, the Canucks then get the power play going. They score the two. They're up 2 nothing. Should have been home and cooled out. And yet they invite this low-scoring Anaheim team back in in the third period. And when it's 2-2, two -two, like, Arthur Silovs was forced to make some saves to keep the Canucks in the game, as crazy as that sounds. So... Yeah, I mean, sharp angle shot by Zellweger, uh, but Phil Hironik uh, clearly uh, running a screen in front of his goaltender. So tough for Silovs there. He talked about it after the game, said, yeah, just you didn't see that. And then uh, now I have to pick a little bit of a bone with you here, Dave. Did I hear you say that JT Miller's not going to make mistakes in the playoffs? Did I get that right? Not like that. He completely lost his man. He's not going to make a mistake like that. All right. Hold this clip, Grady. <laughs> um, anyways, whatever the case, like, sure. Uh, you know, and I think it's important, too, that they get still loves the game. He hadn't played anywhere since March the 9th. That was the night that Demko went down. He had played in the American Hockey League. But then, really, almost three weeks of sitting, waiting for an opportunity. And I think he'll get the Arizona start. And so, something to build off baseline of facing NHL shooters. You know, he's talked about having a good, long stretch of practice with Ian Clark and video work and all that kind of stuff. But none of that replaces... Uh, live ammunition of the best shooters in the NHL, even if they are the Anaheim Ducks. So, uh, yeah, all around, I thought Silovs held up his end of the bargain. I thought the team in front of him had to play a little bit better, but ultimately, guys, it's a win. You take the two points, you don't do a whole lot of critiquing, and you move on knowing that there are going to be a lot bigger challenges, including this one tonight in Vegas. Uh, Jay Pat, pivoting away from the game a little bit, how do you view the month of March as a whole for, for the Canucks? What's your assessment, takeaways, and what do you want to see over the remainder of these regular season games to ensure that the team is peaking heading into the playoffs? Yeah, I agree with your assessment, Harm. Like, you have to see it as a success. Have they played their best hockey? Uh, certainly not offensively. Has the power play been an issue? Yes, it has. They've gone 12 games. 12 games at this time of the year where they have not allowed more than three in regulation. Colorado got a fourth on the power play in overtime. But you got to go back to that 5-1 thumping by the LA Kings at home on February 29th. That was the last time the Canucks gave up more than three in regulation. So they are dialed in defensively. Uh, I guess my concern is you look at who they beat and you said you got to take care of the weak teams. And they did that. But outright losses to the Kings, to the Dallas Stars, and the overtime loss to the Colorado Avalanche. Now, no blowouts, as you said. No absolute duds. But... The game against the Kings when they were down in the third period and one shot in the first 15 minutes. Like, you know, there were stretches. I, I guess that's you know, my concern is there have been stretches in a lot of these games where you would like to see more. Is it maybe too much to expect them to play 60 minutes of perfect hockey? Probably. But when I think of, you know, a few of the teams that got the late second period goals that got them back into games like Colorado, 
Uh, you know, the Washington game of the nine on the homestand, that's one that they, if they play it 10 times, they probably win eight. But that night, Charlie Lindgren was good. He's been good for the Capitals for a while now. And the Canucks just couldn't muster anything in the way of offense. So they're not scoring a lot of goals, but they are not giving up anything right now. And so I think that's an encouraging sign for me is if they can continue to lock things down, you get Thatcher Demko back, you're going to be in almost every game. And then it's a question of, you know, if it's tied in the third period, can they muster the offense needed? You don't have to win five to one playoff time. You just got to get one more than the opponent, even if it takes overtime. So there's a lot to like about the way that they are playing, getting Dakota Joshua back obviously is huge. Connor Garland playing some of the best hockey that he's probably ever played in the NHL uh, right now. And I like the idea of that line with, you know, we like that line with Teddy Bluger. And now you've supercharged it by putting JT Miller in the middle of those guys. So, you know, there's some things to like there. I guess I wonder a little bit about Elias Pettersson. Didn't have a great home stand. Had the big night against Buffalo. And I think everybody was hoping that maybe he had turned a corner. Uh, he had a one-shot attempt. And it was on the power play in the first period against the Ducks. You know, like I was looking at this earlier today. His most frequent opponents on Anaheim the other day, Jackson Lacombe, uh, Gustav Lindstrom, and Leo Carlson. Those were the three guys that EP40 played against the most on Sunday. So it wasn't like he was out there shadowing Frank Rotano around the ice. Uh, there was no whole lot uh, worth shadowing on Anaheim. But, you know, that's where you want to see one of your best, most dynamic players take over and leave the ducks in his dust. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, and I wrote about this, the Canucks army that, you know, everybody's kind of waiting. There's time here, but man, you'd feel better if he could ramp up the production. And I thought it was fascinating guys. Uh, I don't know if you watched Rick Tockett's uh, post morning skate uh, video from Vegas this morning, he was asked about getting Pedersen going. And he said, you know, he's got Hoaglander's 22 goals. He's got Besser now, 38 goals. There were 60 goals on his wing. And it was essentially like, we're giving him the best scores this team has to offer. It is go time for Elias Pettersson to start making some things happen. So, uh, again, there's runway left, but he's got to make it happen. He can't ask. It's not He's not dragging Ilya Mikheyev around the ice anymore. Uh, he's getting a chance to play with their most productive goal scorers this season. Uh, I want to see a little bit of offense uh, from Elias Pettersson. When we talk about this team perhaps wanting a little bit more offense out of them since the All-Star break, how 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 much of that is just Patterson? Like, if he gets going all of a sudden, does that automatically solve the entire team's offensive sort of, um, I don't want to call them struggles, but, or or the point I'm trying to, the question I'm trying to ask is, is there more than just Pedersen to get this team back on track offensively, or is it just getting him going and everything falls into place? Well, I want to see what they look like when he is going. Cause we saw in January, he was one of the stars of the month in the national hockey league and, you know, playing with lotto line, but he's playing with two thirds of lotto line here and Hoaglander's having a great season. Uh, you know, it's there. We know it. We've seen it. We saw those first 10 games of the season where he was, you know, one of the best, like, he had a 15-point lead on Connor McDavid at one point this season in the in the scoring race. That uh, was way back then. Uh, not anymore. But, you know, he had a burst out of the gate, and then he had the big January. Otherwise, there have been these lulls. And that's why I want to believe that there is still an act left in Elias Pettersson this season to be at or near the top of his game. It would go a long way. But I think it's fair to also question the depth scoring because there will be some nights where top-end guys cancel out in the playoffs, and then you're left with that group of, you know, Mikheyev and... Lafferty and Di Giuseppe if he's in there and poor Teddy Bluger who hasn't scored since the game after Christmas against Philadelphia and, and has had all kinds of chances and kind of wonder if you know so if it's a 2-2 tie and all the top players are canceling each other out you know sometimes everybody said oh maybe it's a power play I think it can go the other way and sometimes you know can you squeeze a little bit of offense in some of those tight games out of your bottom six or even your defense and uh, I do have some questions. I don't know if they're concerns, but I think questions that are left unanswered uh, about just the like Pod Colson. You know, if he's going to play in the playoffs, like if you're in uniform, in my mind, I'm not expecting you to score every night, but you have to be the possibility of being a game breaker. Sometimes you need those. You know, everybody's talking about unsung heroes right now. Uh, come playoff time, sometimes those guys can step up and be the difference maker. And I don't know. I don't know about you guys. Like, do you have confidence that? Any of those guys that I just listed off is going to sort of break through and be the guy uh, in a tight playoff game. That's a great point. And I mean, it's kind of the conversation we were having early on in today's show was that yeah, I like the look of the top six, the loaded up top six. It looked better, but 
you need something from that bottom six. And again, it becomes a lot more complicated uh, if you are, in fact, without Elias Lindholm. Hopefully they get him back at some point here. Jeff, so many different directions that we could take this. Uh, you brought up the unsung hero. So I'll ask you that. Who is this team's unsung hero this season? Well, I joked on Twitter because I responded to the Canucks Army post that for me, it's Quinn Hughes across the board. And that wasn't just an ease of filling out a ballot. I, I won't fill out a ballot. It's a fan voting thing. But like, honestly, somebody responded and said, you know what? Like, I wouldn't bat an eye if Quinn Hughes <laughs> swept the awards. Like, honestly, most exciting player. I think I could make a strong argument that Quinn Hughes has been that guy. Best defenseman, of course. Most valuable. He's got my vote there. And I, like, there are a lot of nights where I leave the rink and I think we don't talk enough about Quinn Hughes <laughs> and at the price point for three more years, a 90-point defenseman. So I'm going to sit here and make a case for Quinn Hughes as being unsung uh, in that regard, just against, you know, dollar value against point production. Uh, he won't win the unsung hero, but unsung hero is such a weird one in a market like this where every player's story is written a thousand times throughout the year. Um, you know, I think early on, Casey DeSmith was the unsung hero. Uh, Ian Cole... Uh, you know, Phil DiGiuseppe coming out of training camp and, and earning a spot in the top six. So that has obviously faded. Um, but I, I see the strong wave of support for Connor Garland. And yet it feels like he's been the most talked about guy at the start of the year for some reasons. And obviously he's flipped the script now. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, that's why I'll leave that one to the fans and I'll be surprised when they hand out the year end awards on the 16th of April in the home finale against the Calgary Flames. But, you know, without a doubt, in my mind, Quinn Hughes has been the MVP. I just think that... Uh, uh, has leveled up and tilts the ice so much for the Vancouver Canucks. As great as JT Miller has been this year and as good as Thatcher Demko was in the early going, uh, I just think consistently from start to finish and taking on the added responsibility of being the captain, uh, to me, there's just not much doubt that, that Quinn Hughes has been the MVP. I love it. Uh, you could also make a case, and I think I think you'll get it, I think he will, the Henrik and Daniel Sedin Leadership Award, like community leadership. I think Quinn Hughes has to be considered for that one uh and most three star selection i don't know that i don't know if you keep a tally jeff i know we have the three star segment in rink wide uh, yeah. i don't know if there's a way to just google quickly who is the most three star selection but someone's keeping track and the Canucks will hand out those awards uh when calgary visits on the 16th of april okay jeff i had one more question for you and I, I, we're gonna wrap up here but i have one more question for you uh, about the game nikita zadorov Healthy scratch, load management. We've seen Ian Colby load managed and all that sort of stuff. Surprise you at all that we saw Zadorov a healthy scratch on Sunday? No, I think Rick Tocchet had tipped us off that he said that we might be surprised with uh, sort of how deep that load management goes. I think for me, uh, it was interesting. After practice on Monday, they practiced in Vancouver and then flew to Vegas. And Tocchet was asked, will Zadorov, will Zadorov get back in? And he was willing to say yes the day before a game. And then... Somebody asked who's coming out, and he said, oh, we haven't made that decision yet. Again, this morning, optional, so we didn't see pairs out there skating. Uh, I know Zadorov took the option. Uh, uh, to me, guys, an opponent like Vegas and a possible playoff preview, I think we can read into whoever goes as the top six tonight or the six defensemen, a pretty good indication in the eyes of the coaching staff that this might be the way they line up in game one. And I'm not convinced that Noah Juleson's going to be the healthy scratch. Tockett didn't declare who the scratch was, so we're going to have to wait until warm-up. I do wonder if Ian Cole is going to be the guy that that sits here. Uh, it's uh, Juleson's 27th birthday, so it would kind of suck for him to have to sit out a game. But uh, So that's something to watch heading into this game. Uh, obviously, with back-to-backs, I think we'll see some load management in Arizona on Wednesday, so I would be surprised if it's the same six that go in both of these games. Uh, and the other thing to watch, too, just based on the events of the last couple of days, Brock is going to play tonight, but I'm curious to see, uh, you know, if there's any sort of discernible thing that is slowing him down in any way. I know speed's not uh, his strong suit, but left practice, that was curious. He participated for about 15 minutes at Monday's practice and then left. Wasn't available after the game on Sunday when he scored against the Ducks. We asked for him in the media, and he we were told he was in treatment then. We were told he was in treatment after practice yesterday. Uh, I was encouraged to see him taking the optional this morning, so he was out there, got a twirl in. But you don't get that much treatment if you're not playing through something, and I know a lot of guys are at this stage of the year, but just keep an eye on Brock Besser and his availability and sort of, uh, uh, you know, does he look like the normal Brock Besser and – you know, he's in, within two of 40 now, so I'm sure he wants to play every game that he can to try to get those two goals that he needs to, to reach the 40-goal mark. 
Jeff, great stuff as always. Thanks so much for doing this. People can find you and Irf on Gafar. I asked beforehand today, uh, yes. you and Irf, post-game tonight. <laughs> I, I knew who my game. co-host was, yeah, so, hey, that's progress. I had done my homework. I was able to answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Uh, Irf will be in studio, and uh, uh, it's getting good, guys. Eight to go, and then the playoffs. So uh, we're ramp- ramping things up on rink-wide, uh, as I know you are in Canucks Convo, and uh, – can start to feel it. So big one tonight, a big road trip, and let's see how they respond to uh, uh, what I'm sure will be a pretty good test at the hands of the Vegas Golden Knights. Good stuff, Jeff. Thanks so much for doing this. All right, guys. Thanks. There is Jeff Patterson, who, as I mentioned a few times there, you can find on Rinkwide Vancouver post game. And here's the thing about Rinkwide: you can listen to it anytime you want. Harm, I was driving. I was driving on Monday. And I was listening to Rink Wide, but the game happened on Sunday and I was still well informed about that game, even though I listened to it a day later. I had to do my prep, right? I had to do my prep for uh, today's show. Uh, do you have anything else that you want to say about the Sunday game before we move on, Harm? No, I'm ready to move on. Okay, let's do it. Let's get to our Light the Lamp contest brought to you by our friends at Four Winds Brewing. Vancouver is playing Vegas tonight, and we want to know who's going to score the first goal for Vancouver. If you nail it, you could win a $25 gift card to the Four Winds Tap Room located at 72nd and River Road in Delta. Enter by following us on social media, keep an eye out for today's show clip, and comment who you think will light the lamp and score the first goal tonight. Winners will be contacted directly. Check us out at Canucks Army on Twitter, at CanucksArmy.com on Instagram, and Canucks Army on Facebook. And make sure you ask about Four Winds Light light lager at your local liquor store or have some delivered to your front door through the online shop at fourwindsbrewing.ca. Harm, I am going with Elias Pedersen tonight. I think he's been a little bit up and down. I think he needs to get on track. And against Vegas, I'm looking for Elias Pedersen to come out and set the tone early for the Canucks. He is going to score the first goal for your Vancouver Canucks. I'm going to go with Garland. I think that line was dynamite against Anaheim. and. I think he's just playing some of the best hockey uh, of his career right now. Okay, uh, Vegas tonight. What are you expecting to see from the Golden Knights? Yeah, so this is a different team than the one the Canucks played the last time the Canucks were in Vegas. Um, Vegas is really tightened up defensively because you remember the fir- the last time these two teams met, Vegas was just coming off a uh, 7-2 blowout loss against the Sabres and a 6-3 blowout loss uh, against Blue Jackets. They were a defensive mess. Their goaltending was in disarray. They had trouble breaking the puck out. Uh, Noah Hannafin was just making his Vegas Golden Knights uh, debut the, the, uh, the last time these teams met. Um, and since then, they've really stabilized. Since March 8th, they're starting to peak and look really scary again. 8-2-1 and one record since then. And defensively, here's the key. Second best goals against rate in the NHL in that span. And they don't even have Mark Stone and Tomash Hurdle yet. And Hurdle, of course, practiced for the first time, I believe, the other day, but was in a non-contact sweater. I don't think he's expected to play against Vancouver. But if Vegas is this stingy defensively and they are still missing two of their top forwards, I think that's a sign. Uh, I think that's a sign that they're ramping up and that this is going to be a different test to generate offense than last time. The other internal answer that they're starting to find is Logan Thompson is making his case to take the starter crease. He's on a five-game win streak, has a 962 save percentage. And that was huge last time because if you remember, PDG scored his first point. It was a goal, but it was his first point since November. And it was like a rebound that was flat along the ice that Aiden Hill should have stopped all all day. Um, The Canucks got a fortunate break there. Um, I don't think you're going to have that type of break against Logan Thompson if he continues his form. So with them tightening up defensively and having a hot goalie, I think this is going to have um, a a much more playoff-like feel than last time when it felt like the Canucks were just dictating and were pretty easily able to put the boot down. Just looking at the NHL standings, which feels like we should do at the start of each week until the playoffs actually start. Uh, feels like just a week ago, Harm, we were talking about, well, if the Canucks win the Pacific, if they win the West, they're going to be facing the Vegas Golden Knights uh, with LA losing their last three. And as you said, Vegas going on a bit of a heater right now. Uh, Vegas has moved up to the third spot in the Pacific. Edmonton in second place. We're going to get to them in a second. I want to ask you a question about them. But focusing on Vegas here, uh, looks like they 
are going to finish third in the Pacific. Again, LA could go on a heater. Vegas could fall off. But just given trends and what we've seen, uh, looks like it's not going to be Vegas in the wildcard spot. Right now, it's Nashville and LA. And if the playoffs started today, the Canucks would be facing the Nashville Predators who are in the first wildcard spot. We're not going to do the thing where we analyze <laughs> uh, analyze each opponent and look at, oh, who would you most like to face? I'm just saying that's what the schedule, that's what the standings look like right now. Uh, shifting away from Vegas a little bit, and I still had some stuff to say on the game, so we'll get to it in a second. But uh, Jeff, who we just talked to, had this tweet earlier today where he talked about the math for the Edmonton Oilers to come back and take first in the Pacific from the Vancouver Canucks. If the Canucks go four and four, they'll get to 108 points. The Oilers would then need to go seven and two to get to 109, and they need to finish ahead because the Canucks hold the tiebreaker. Both teams have tough schedules. The Oilers somehow finish with six games in nine nights. So the Oilers are going to be playing a ton, tough opponents. It looks like it's not going to be super easy for them to do this. Harm, are you worried? I asked you last week. I said no. Are you still at all worried about the Edmonton Oilers catching up to the Vancouver Canucks? I think it's a pretty remote possibility at this point. I think the Canucks will get it done, especially because Edmonton's schedule really isn't that um, easy. I mean, they they have a three games and four nights stretch coming up where they're going to play uh, Dallas on Wednesday, Colorado on Friday. And then, yeah, you've got a weaker Calgary team on Saturday, but that's your third game in four nights, the second leg of back-to-back. Uh, as well travel involved travel involved too so that's not going to be easy and then they begin next week by playing vegas um the biggest matchup in determining who finishes first is going to be that head-to-head on uh, saturday april the 13th and the canucks have the advantage in the sense that uh, edmonton is going to be on the second leg of a back-to-back after having played arizona the night before so that should hopefully hopefully play to vancouver's favor um, and then again, they have another pack to back, uh, to finish the season out against Colorado, uh, too. So they have a tough time in terms of how condensed their schedule is, how many back to backs, the, the quality of their opponents and playing Colorado twice and the Canucks control their own fate here and in, in having that head to head against Edmonton. I think the Canucks should pull through with this one. Yep. We'll see tonight, uh, where it ends up with, uh, Vegas, of course, but I'm curious. I'm watching that battle. I'm watching that little battle. And again, these two teams, Edmonton and Vancouver, will face off on the 13th of April. That game could have some serious playoff implications. We'll see. We'll see what ends up happening. But again, you hope the Canucks can take care of business tonight against the Vegas Golden Knights and tomorrow against the Arizona Coyotes. Of course, we'll be back tomorrow to break down uh, tonight's game and, of course, preview tomorrow's game against the Arizona Coyotes. I just want to say about that Anaheim game and kind of about tomorrow's game as well, uh, Archer Seelov is expected to get the start tomorrow. To Smith starts in goal for the Canucks in Vegas tonight. I really liked Archer Seelov's game. I, I thought that first goal really wasn't on him. Uh, the second goal, again, we talked about it. JT Miller loses coverage in monumental fashion. That goal shouldn't happen, won't happen in the playoffs, as I said. Uh, so in my books, Archer Seelov's got a shutout on Sunday. So I just want to get that out there. Yeah, I don't know how, how uh, the math works for shutout with you goalie guys. Ready to absolve the goalie of all blame uh, <laughs> on any goal. There's always something going on. Uh, but no, in all seriousness, he was um, he was sharp. He was good. I think for his season debut, it was as good as you could expect. And like Jay Pat pointed to, he had to make some quality saves. I think about the Troy Terry save um, off a rebound early in the third period. Uh, uh, in the in the second period, the opportunity that Frank Vitrano had after the puck bounced off the end boards and Vitrano pounced on it. Uh, the save on Leo Carlson when he was walking into the slot on the power play in the second period. Uh, and yeah, like the Mason McTavish goal, he legit had no chance on. And it wasn't just Miller. The Canucks had three guys all in that vicinity swarming Mc- McTavish, yet none of them were tying him up or able to take that passing lane away. Again, normally that doesn't happen with this uh, team and you're not going to fault that on c So yeah, he was sharp. And I think that definitely gives you some confidence. Um heading into him probably playing the second leg of the back-to-back against Arizona. Final thing for me about tonight's game is that I'm very, very curious to see who comes out of the lineup on the defensive court. And again, it's a back-to-back, so it's not going to be the same six guys tomorrow, but I'm still really interested to see. The biggest thing, I don't think it'll happen, but 
back-to-back scratches for Nikita Zadorov would then be the thing that we start talking about a little bit more. Again, his load management, uh, don't think you have to read into it too much. I know his agent probably isn't stoked about it, but this is what the Canucks are doing right now. They're trying to keep their guys fresh for the playoffs, and talk it has been very, very open about that. So we'll see uh, tonight. I'm very curious to see who it is. Okay, uh, let's get to... I think anyone else is all we have left. Let's get to anyone else presented by DoorDash. It's our listener's chance to get involved and hit us up in the YouTube live chat. And it's also our listener's chance to get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when they download the DoorDash app and enter code NATION25. That's all capital letters, NATION, and the numbers 25. Offer valid in Canada, subject to change terms to apply with Double Dash on DoorDash. You can order from multiple restaurants or stores in the same delivery without additional delivery fees so everyone can get what they want and need. Check out DoorDash. The code again is NATION25. Okay, folks, get your anyone else's in. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm very curious here. This one from Jesse C. I'll start with this one. Is that Russian goalie for the Flyers on the wrong side of the size bell curve for optimum goalie body? Is he too big and lengthy, equaling more holes? I'm going to default to conversations I've had with Ian Clark on this one. And the way he's explained, and again, the, the goalie we're talking about, don't know his name. He's the t- tallest goalie to ever play in the NHL at six foot seven. Um, the thing that Ian's kind of talked to me about and the thing I've learned from Ian Clark in my conversations with him is that this thing that Ian likes to call length really doesn't have much to do with height. It has way more to do with what you're able to do when you're in the butterfly. Uh, It has way more to do with athleticism. Just a quick example, like a guy like Seelovs in his draft year, the reason they really like Seelovs, the really, the reason they really liked, um, Koskenvo as well, this kind of archetype of these goalies that are super lanky, but also really flexible and really athletic. That's the thing that impresses them is they're able to get down in the butterfly, seal off the bottom of the net extremely well. Once they're down there, they're able to move around on the ice very well because their knee is able to stay flush to the ice when they're down in the butterfly and moving around. And again, that that matters a lot. Uh, That's that length that Ian talks about so much. So again, you can be super tall, uh, and, and you can be really athletic, like a Jacob Markstrom, for example. Like Jacob Markstrom, six foot six, wasn't on the wrong side of the bell curve there that you're discussing there, Jesse. But a guy like Anders Nilsson, same size, I'd argue was less athletic and kind of did have those faults in his game where he was too big. And again, you bring up Markstrom, those holes that you're talking about, and we know how much we like to talk about holes on this show. Uh, those holes were so evident in Markstrom's game early on, but they really cleaned it up through the work he did with Ian Clark. So uh, again, I I don't want to say that someone's on the wrong side of the bell curve. And honestly, I didn't even know the guy's name. I don't know his game well enough to say, yeah, he's athletic enough to overcome all that. Um, Again, it's not just size that matters is what I'm trying to say. And again, I don't know the person's name, the the goalie that you're talking about. I don't know his name off the top of my head. Yeah, Fedotov, sure. Um, I just know that he's six foot seven and read that he's the tallest goalie to play in the NHL. So good for him. But uh, I definitely don't know enough about him to come and make a sweeping judgment. I'm just telling you, this is what I've learned about the position over my years in the game. Okay. Uh, This one also from Jesse C. Let's get to this one. Better job extracting value. Near league minimum guys to be legit NHL players. Getting Besser Garland back to producing. Or free agent signings being all bang on in value. I think it's... You can't... Hmm... I think it's pretty close between getting Besser and Garland back to producing at their contract or even Besser's case, providing a little bit of surplus value um, and being bang on with all of your free agent signings and the collective value you uh, produced in identifying Pia Suter, Teddy Bluger, Carson Soucy, um, going up and down lineup. Even like, I know he's not a free agent signing, but trading for Casey DeSmith and having him being be a really effective backup considering how volatile NHL goaltending has been. I think that's a massive win. I think it's pretty close between the, the latter two um, scenarios. I think you're absolutely correct. I, again, those league minimum guys turning into legit NHLers uh, again, Juleson and Lafferty reuses the examples. Uh, there's value in that, but look, Sam Lafferty has been great value for the Canucks, but look at him right now, right? Those guys have their ups and downs. And again, not so much Juleson, I guess, because I would argue that Juleson kind of 
maybe fits into that second category where it's a guy on a contract that's producing. Uh, but again, Juleson's providing surplus value. So it's hard. It's a good question, Jesse. It's a really good question. Um, but again, I, I think those last two are the ones that really, really matter the most. Okay, here we go. This one from Karn. Would you guys try Dak, PD, Garley? So that, you, so that way you can keep JT and Besser, which has been working all season. It's a good question, Karn. Uh, I look at it and say... I really liked what Joshua and Garland were able to do with Miller. And I also would argue that Miller fits better between those guys than Pedersen does. Like, I think from a stylistic standpoint, I like having Miller on that line more than I do Pedersen. Um, and again, I know JT Besser has been working all season, but I'd also say maybe it hasn't been all season. Maybe it's been most of the season. I think lately those guys haven't made you think those guys can't be separated. They got to be together. So I think that, partly goes into it and ultimately goes into why I say uh, I like it how it is right now. Yeah, I like it how it is now. Can you expand? I'm, I'm curious to get your take on why you think Miller's a better stylistic fit potentially with uh, Joshua and Garland compared to Patterson. I think he just has that higher motor. And I mean, the thing that gives me doubt about that take is that Pedersen did look good with Garland as well. And look, Pedersen, Pedersen can get guys the puck and he plays well with guys who can also get him the puck. But I just think right now with the way that I've, what, what I've seen from Joshua and Garland all season long just makes me think that uh, they'd be better between or with JT as their center. But again, I I'm not, I'm not married to the take by any means, because I also just look at it and say like JT Ambassador has worked, but also Pedersen and Garland worked recently as well. The thing that also kind of gives, makes me think that I do like JT more between those guys harm is that up to this point for most, most of his Canucks tenure, like this isn't the first time we've seen Connor Garland play with Elias Pedersen. Right. And I, I'm just looking at it and saying, which of these lines has a better chance of drying up? more quickly i would say it's the one that has patterson with garland yeah also hoaglander has found a home i think alongside patterson and not that he's been able to get patterson going because that because that's not really his responsibility but hoaglander individually is playing at a legit top six level since the all-star break which needs to continue for this team to have enough uh forward offensive fi firepower i don't want to mess with Hoaglander and have him potentially playing with JT, which it's not to say that JT is a worse player or I don't like the fit between Hoaglander and Miller because I, I do think when both guys are going that they can mesh, but why, why mess with something that's working for Hoaglander? So while I don't hate the, hate the suggestion, um, I, I agree with just sticking with, uh, with what they went out with against Anaheim. Yeah. Um, I didn't even think of that Hoaglander thing. And since you brought it up, I wrote about it at Canucks Army as well today about who the Canucks unsung hero is. Uh, I think Thursday when we're back in studio and it's a travel day for the team, I think we're going to have to do our team awards and give each of our picks and kind of get into it a bit more. But I think Niels Hoaglander has a serious case for unsung hero. And I just look at like, what does this team look like right now? If they make the Lindholm trade, it doesn't work out like it has, right? It doesn't work out. And then they also don't have Niels Hoglander. I mean, this is something you brought up last week, but it made me think of it a lot in terms of the unsung hero. I think Niels Hoglander has a really, really solid case to be named the unsung hero. I I'll say well, let's save that for for Thursday. I've got sure. some I've got some takes. We'll save it. We'll save it. Okay, uh, RP eighty eight. What do you think the starting split will be like for Demko and DeSmith during the playoffs? Do you think they'll only let DeSmith play if we're in a good spot during a series? RP eighty eight. I would say. Yes, and even then I might be surprised to see a dismiss start. You're going with your starter in the playoffs. They're riding with Demko the whole way. Yeah, you go Demko all day long. Um, if DeSmith is in, it's it's not good. Put it that way. I mean, even if you're in a good spot during a series, like say you're up 3-0 in the first round and you throw DeSmith out and then you lose that game and a team uh -uh. now has the be the bulletin board material that they just put their backup in because they thought they'd get the sweep against us, and now you're down. Now you're up three one. I don't know. I I don't I don't think that's a good mojo to put out there. I'm saying it's Demko all the way. Okay. Uh, a lot of squirrel talk. A lot of squirrel <laughs> talk in the uh, YouTube live chat here. Uh, people asking about Lindholm. We don't really have any real updates on Lindholm. He did skate his wrist. It looked like or his hand was heavily taped up. Uh, when he did that skate, and I think that was shown on Sunday's broadcast as well. So 
Uh, no real update on him just yet, but we is do he, also know. Yeah, uh, I was going to say, is he? I believe I saw something about him traveling with uh, with the team on this trip. Yeah, so he traveled with the team, and also the guy I was going to bring up, Thatcher Demko, is with the team, and he skated. He's not expected to return on the trip, but he did skate today in Vegas. So um, that's a really, really good sign, obviously, and it kind of goes on track with hoping that he's going to get at least three starts ahead of jumping into the Stanley Cup playoffs, which we expect are going to start on April 20th. Another thing happening on April 20th as we wrap up this Anyone Else segment is our event, which we are calling Bro Do Your Playoffs. Join us and the rest of the Canucks Army crew on Saturday, April 20th at the Hollywood Theater in Kitsilano for a special tribute to our late friend Jason Botchford presented by Fountain Tire. Jason made a significant impact on all our lives and we want to honor his legacy in the media the best way we know how by celebrating the Canucks race to the playoffs. The event coined Bro Do Your Playoffs is a media event celebrating the life and legacy of Jason that will feature shared memories, special guests, an exclusive performance from the matinee and the celebration of Vancouver's return to the playoffs. This up close and personal event will take place on April 20th from 12 p.m. until 5 p.m. with the proceeds going to support a local me local mental health organization chosen by Cat Botchford. So be sure to come out and join us. Tickets for ten dollars. Get them at nationgear.ca. There's also a sale right now at Nation Gear as well for some merch. You can check that out. All of our regular season merch is on sale. Uh, so nationgear.ca is the place to go for event tickets and also uh, your merch as well i know someone was asking about events and we're gonna have some during the playoffs as well we got a lot of fun stuff planned and i brought up greta earlier sounds like greta sounds like it's gonna be at greta because they are the home of our electric watch parties uh sino chick pointing out that uh, on top of it being noah Julson's birthday elise patterson's 400th game in the nhl tonight so i picked him for f my uh, light the lamp contest and i'm really liking that pick now that i know it's his 400th game yeah, your your vibes are you just knew that. The vibes just sense that it's 400th game. That's right. That's a great way to put it, Harm. We'll close it up there. Uh we'll be back tomorrow and we'll be back in studio on Thursday for my co-host Harmon Dial and our technical producer Grady Sass. My name is Dave Jolly. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Canucks Conversation. Canucks Conversation with Harmon and Quads brought to you by the Toyota BZ4X. The BZ4X's fresh look is just an added bonus to its range since you can drive up to 406 kilometers on a single charge. That's enough to get you from Kitsilano to Whistler or Kamloops to Kelowna and back and still be home in time for the game. Now that's what we'd call electric. The best part, by choosing electric, you can get up to $11,000 in rebates and incentives the BZ4X are in stock and selling quickly, so make sure to visit shoptoyota.ca or your local Pacific Toyota dealer to get your hands on one. Canucks Conversation is live Monday through Friday, every weekday at 2 p.m. over on the Canucks Army YouTube channel. Make sure you like, subscribe, and interact in the YouTube live chat every day with us, folks.